today as we come to the table. They say, we want to make sure that they all grow up knowing that they're free to be whatever they want and, and they need to know that, you know, that they can whatever, this kind of thing. Listen, to stand up in today's society and say that's wrong, that can be scary. Why? Because a lot of the world's going to turn against you. You bigot, you're, you're, you're whatever, and they'll call you whatever name they call you. But God says for the believer, stand up. Don't be afraid. When it's the battle of the Lord, stand. One with God is a majority. And you may get mocked by the world, you may get attacked by the world, or whatever the case might be, but make a stand. He says, Maros, you didn't do that. When God's people were being attacked, you just kind of, nah, I'm not getting in that. He says, you're cursed. When you witness two people or groups having a disagreement, do you stand up for one of the sides? There are many times people don't stand up in the name of not wanting to get involved or because they don't want either side to be mad at them. How about when it's a topic you care about? Do you stand up then? Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. Too many times Christians stand on the sidelines of a moral argument and don't stand up for biblical truth. It's usually because they don't want to ruffle any feathers. Well, in today's message, Pastor Mark warns you, if you don't stand up for the battle of the Lord, you may not upset anyone, but you will be cursed. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Judges, chapter 3, with today's edition of Come to the Table. He said to her, stand at the door of the tent. And if any man comes and inquires of you and says, is there any man here? Then you shall say no. And Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg. Now these things were, again, these are not small little nails. These are big spikes because they would use them to hold down the edges of the tents. And the wind out in the wilderness like that, I mean, it would blow pretty hard. You really had to really nail down your tents. By the way, the women were really strong because they're the ones, are you ready for this? All the tough men of that day, the women set all the tents up. They would drive the stakes in the ground, set these tents up, do all the work, and the men would just show up and, and lay on their rug and start doing whatever a man does, right? But the women did that. So the women were really tough. She knew how to nail a tent peg. She was good at it. And so you imagine a big steel spike, all right? More like a railroad tie almost, you know, I mean, not tie, but railroad spike. Um, uh, the metal pegs that they put them with, then the little thing you might be thinking of. It's not like a nail that way. And she took this tent peg took a hammer in her hand, you can see what's coming here, and she went softly to him, look at this gentle little woman, and she drove the tent peg into his temple, and it went down into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, and so he died. Was, bam, he was done. Now, this is one tough lady, again, but this is something where God was bringing judgment on Sisera, because Sisera was now being judged by the Lord for oppressing the children of Israel. And God raised up not only one woman to lead them, Deborah, strong woman in the Lord. He raised up now another woman, Jael, uh, to fight against them as well. And to, to, she's going to be the one that gets the main glory of this. And then as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him. And, and she said to him, come and I'll show you the man whom you seek. It's like, hey, you that guy you're looking for? I, I've, I know where he is. I've got him. What? Yep, I've got him. Come on, I'll show you. Wow. Who are you? You know? And when, she went, uh, when he went into the tent, there lay Sisera dead with the peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of uh, Canaan, uh, Sisera's commander, until they had destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. So God giving them greater and greater victory until they had victory there in that whole region. And now we come to the song of Deborah in chapter 5, and now they begin to sing this song about what God has done. Now, this is quite the song. You think we have a lot of verses in our song. This is quite the song here. Look what it says. And Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. They start the song off by saying, when, when God's people, when they'll step up and lead, everyone's blessed. 
when leaders will just lead. And really, it's almost kind of a, um, I don't know if that made, uh, you know, Barrett feel a little bit bad or not. Uh, he probably is feeling like, okay, well, I led some. You came with me, but I led a little bit. Uh, because really, really what this verse is saying is how blessed Israel is when the, when the leaders will lead. And God called the men to step up and lead. And when the men step up and lead, how blessed they are. How blessed the families are. How blessed the church is when men will just lead and be leaders. It's a shame when the women have to become the leaders because the men won't do it. Again, nothing wrong in that. I'm not, this is not wrong about women being leaders or some issue about one. Be, I, I shouldn't have to say that in the church, but with the environment we live in today, I feel like I have to at least mention that. But the point they're saying is, is how God will bless if, 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 if Barak had just led, you know? And Deborah did lead, and then Barak kind of led after she led. He says, hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I'll sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, or the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured. What he's saying is, during this battle, there was a great thunderstorm. That's going to explain in just a minute why it says that the river Kishon was, tor was a torrent. Because what happened is, the earth is trembling. That's the thunder. God began to send thunder, and God began to send rain. Why would God send thunder and rain in that battle? Because remember who had all the iron chariots with the wheels trying to get through the mud. See, what God did when he began to attack, God brings a rainstorm, sends all the rain in. God uses nature oftentimes in battles. The Bible says he uses snow and other things for battles. And so God sends rain, makes the field all muddy. The chariots became useless. You can't go anywhere if all the chariots are stuck in the mud. Now the enemies of, uh, the enemies of Israel can be overtaken. The men of, of, of you know, Barak, they go and they begin to fight them sword on sword. It's an even battle. They have to jump out of their tanks, so to speak, and leave their horses behind in their iron coverings in these chariots and fight them hand to hand to hand. God was helping the children of Israel, so they defeated them. So it's raining real hard during this battle. There's thunder. There's lightning. The clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord. This Sinai before the Lord God of Israel... And notice this is interesting here. We read that one verse in verse 31 of the last chapter about Shamgar. It says, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anoth. Again, we don't know much about him, but he gets another honorable mention. So he was a, a good man, servant of the Lord. And also notice who else gets mentioned? In the days of Jael. Remember, Jael is the one who drove the Nael through his head, right? That's how you remember that. But either way, not that you need to remember that, but it may be some quiz on some game show that's worth $100,000, you know. Who was the one who drove the nail and Cicero's breath? Child! Anyway, you, you'll remember that now. You may win. If, if you do, you need to tithe. So the days of Jael, the highways were deserted and the travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased. Uh, it ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. Isn't that great? I mean, she was a mother to Israel. She was like, I'm your mom. And, and I'm going to, you know, listen, moms can be tough. She was a tough mom for the children of Israel. She did the right thing. She made a stand. And because, again, the, the men weren't doing what they were supposed to do, she stood up and she filled in that gap. And yeah, I, I admire that. And that's the right thing to do. And I oftentimes, I've had women over the years come to me and say, my husband is not really leading us at all as a family in the Lord. There's never anything to do with God in our family. There's never, he doesn't lead. He's, he just sits around and just sits there and doesn't do anything. My answer to that kind of wife, and I've met many of them over the years, is then you step up. It shouldn't be that way. I know they should be leading, but if they're not going to lead, mom, don't let your family die because your husband's being a deadbeat. Rise up. Raise up your kids and watch God be faithful. And so Deborah's saying, I arose like a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then there was war in the gates. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with the rulers of Israel. Notice her heart's pouring at her. I, I love the rulers of Israel. My heart's with them who, offend, uh, who, who offered themselves willingly with the Lord or, or with the people. Bless the Lord. So those who came to battle and said, I'll fight, I'll fight. Let's go do this thing. She says, my heart's with them. Speak, you who ride on white donkeys. Now, white donkeys, that was a sign of leaders. The leaders would ride white donkeys. So she's saying, again, speak, you leaders, you ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges attire and who walk along the road, far from the noise of the archers among the watering places. There they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord. So they'll do the battles and they'll talk about God's victories. The righteous acts for his villages in Israel. Then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. When the gates is where, or where the leaders would, would sit and judge. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Abinoam. So again, he did lead, but he's, you notice he's coming last. Jael's already been mentioned. Even Shamgar, who wasn't in this battle, got mentioned. 
Deborah's being mentioned. Finally, Barak gets his, his say in here because he was a part of it, but he's way down the ladder because he didn't step up when he should have. Then the survivors came down, the people against the nobles. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim were those whose roots were in Amalek. After you, Benjamin, with your people. From Machir, rulers came down. And from Zebulun, those who bear the recruiter's staff. You know, again, they were recruiting the warriors to come in. They came down to help. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. So that's that region up in there, Zebulun and Issachar. They helped out. As Issachar, so was Barak, sent into the valley under his command. Among the divisions of Reuben, there was great resolves of heart. So again, notice this. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the pipings of the flocks? The divisions of of Reuben have great searchings of heart. What he's saying is, Reuben, you heard the battle cry and you sat back and didn't do anything. You knew there was, God said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel. God said, go and make disciples of all nations. And rather than do that and obey the Lord, you just sat back and let everybody else do it. That's what he's doing. He's, rebu- he's rebuking Reuben. I called you to battle, Reuben. And you didn't do it. You stayed home and made sandwiches. Reuben sandwiches. No, I'm sorry. Anyway. That, that joke's too old to even to use again. I'm sorry. I apologize. But, there, but notice what he's saying is, you're having great searchings of heart now. Why? Because you realize, I should have stepped up to the plate. I really should have helped. I should have been involved. I shouldn't have just sat back and let everybody else do it. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan remain on the ships? Dan didn't help. Gilead, what are they doing? They didn't help. They were, God called them to the battle. Everyone knew this war was taking place. And like, you know what? You guys deal with it. It's not our problem. We live way down here. And God is now rebuking them, saying, you should have gotten involved in the work of the Lord. Asher continued at the seashore and stayed by his inlets. Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death. Now, you guys did nothing, and Zebulun said, I'll lay it all down for the Lord. I was looking at a magazine that I have. It's an old life magazine from 1948. I was, um, you know, we moved in recently in our house, and we're still putting things away, and I'm getting out some things and putting them on shelves and all that. Finally, get my office and home set up and all that. And I, I pulled them. I'd, I'd kind of forgotten I had it, but then when I saw it, I was like, yes, I remember. Somebody gave it to me as a gift. It's a life magazine from 1948, the first issue that came out after Israel declared themselves a nation. And in the magazine, it talks about Israel declaring themselves a nation and all that happened. And it has pictures in there. And, and I don't know if they would do that today, but pictures of dead Israeli soldiers laying there from the battles. Kind of like, wow, that's, I don't know, I don't know if in a magazine they do that today or not, but there they were. And my thought was, wow, these are men, they were young men. And they gave their life for their nation. I said, you know what? We're, we're, we're fighting for our nation. God is, we're back in the land. We're a nation again. Here come our enemies. We're going to fight. This is the same kind of idea that he's talking about, that she's talking about. Zebulun says they jeopardized their lives to the point of death. We're willing to put our lives on the line. We'll go fight for Israel. And because those men that I saw laying there dead from 1948 fought for the nation of Israel, and really I know it's because of the Lord, but because they stepped up to the plate and answered the call, what happened? Now they're back in the land. They're established as a nation and they're safe. I know everyone hates them, but they're strong and they're safe. They're protected of the Lord. And so she's saying, these guys did this, Naphtali also on the heights of the battlefield. The kings came and fought. The kings of Canaan fought. In Tanakh, by the waters of Megiddo. Now, what are the waters of Megiddo? We're going to see the, again, the Kishon, which again was a torrent when the storm came. They took no spoils of silver. They fought from heaven. Look, look at this. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. Now, there, you get some, we're pulling the spiritual curtain back a little bit here. Did you know in scripture that angels are referred to as stars? Another name for angels in the Bible are stars. You have literal stars, and the angels are referred to as stars. We see in Job that it says the stars uh, rejoiced with God when he created everything. And so uh, you see them, the, again, we see here the picture of the stars fighting from heaven. It's speaking of the angels were in this battle. You know, he said God gave the victory. God had angels there fighting against these guys. So they've got lightning and thunder. They've got the angels fighting against them. God putting fear in the heart of the enemy. God encouraging, you know, uh, 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 Barak because of Deborah and all this. These guys didn't have a chance. The torrents of Kishon swept them away. Again, this is that small little creek area there that again becomes this raging torrent when it, when it rains hard, like flash flood. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon, oh my soul, march on in strength. It's almost like this declaration of yes, God was, gave us power. Then the horses who have pounded, the galloping, galloping of the steeds, 
Curse Miraz, said the angel of the Lord. Notice why. Curse its inhabitants bitterly. Why? This, this wasn't who they were fighting. This is another people group that lived right there close to the battle. He said, curse its inhabitants bitterly because they did not come to the help of the Lord to help the Lord against the mighty. Guys, there is a reward when we make a stand in our culture today. When our culture is going against the word of God and they're downing God's word and they're fighting against the things of God and they're fighting against right and exalting wrong, God says, you know what? As believers, we're to step up. And we're saying, you know what? I'm sorry, that's not right. Here's what the Word of God says. This is what's right, and that's wrong. You know, you, you, again, you may have heard, I don't know if you did or not, but Governor Brown in California this passed some new law that they have to teach homosexual you know, relations and all that, how that works among, among people to the elementary students now. It's required in California schools. They have to teach it to them. Because they say, we want to make sure that they all grow up knowing that they're free to be whatever they want. And, and they need to know that, you know, that they can whatever, this kind of thing. Listen, to stand up in today's society and say that's wrong, that can be scary. Why? Because a lot of the world's going to turn against you. You bigot. You're, you're, you're whatever. And they'll call you whatever name they call you. But God says for the believer, stand up. Don't be afraid. When it's the battle of the Lord, stand. One with God is a majority. And you may get mocked by the world. You may get attacked by the world or whatever the case might be. But make a stand. He says, Maros, you didn't do that. When God's people were being attacked, you just kind of, nah, I'm not getting in that. He says, you're cursed. Heavy, heavy. Most blessed among women is Jael. Now she's going to be exalted even more because she was involved. She and Deborah, they're the ones that are doing the victory lap here. The wife of Heber the Kenite. Blessed is she among women in tents. He asked for water. She gave him milk. She brought out cream in a lordly bowl. Now she, they begin to wax eloquent here. I doubt it was a lordly bowl. It might have been, whatever that is. She stretched out her hand to the tent peg, her right hand, so the workman's hammer, or to the workman's hammer, she pounded Sisera, she pierced his head, she split and struck through the temple. You thought I was giving you details. And her feet, or rather at her feet, he sank, he fell, he lay still. At her feet, he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. Pretty graphic. Again, I, you know what kind of tune this had? I don't know. <laughs> you know I think about it. <laughs> Sounds more like, you know, some kind of, I don't know, grunge metal or something. But <laughs> and The mother of Sisera looked through the window and cried out through the lattice. Why is the chariot so long in coming? Why tarry, tarries the clatter of the chariot saying, look, his family was looking for him. He's not coming home. Her wisest ladies answered her, and yes, she answered herself, are they not finding and dividing the spoil? To every man a girl or two. For Sisera plundered, uh, uh, for Sisera, plunder of dyed garments, uh, plunder of garments embroidered and dyed, two pieces of dyed embroidery, embroidery for the neck of the looter. So they're going, the reason he's not back yet is he's got so much reward. He's trying to gather it all up, and the women are going, oh, you're a hero, Sisera, and all this. Like, no, he's dead. Thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord. I love this. Look how this ends. The enemies of God will perish, but he finishes with this, and this is where we'll finish tonight. But let those who love him, that is those who love the Lord, be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. Wow. He says, you love the Lord, may you shine bright for God in righteousness. I love it. What a great, powerful chapter. So the land had rest for 40 years. So again, after this whole situation here, uh, they have another generation of rest and all that goes on. Next week, we'll get into uh, Gideon and the Midianites. Amazing things that God did with Gideon and the Midianites. Just amazing. So if you want to read ahead, go ahead and read chapters 6, 7, and 8. Um, because we'll do our best to get through the story of Gideon. Uh, next week, and cover those three chapters. But again, what a powerful portion of Scripture. You know, just I guess the lesson for us, and I'm going to give you that same lesson as we're working through the book of Judges is, you know, if we're not walking with God the way we should walk with him, guys, let's get it right. Don't waste time. Don't, don't let, if tonight, if tonight you're miserable, you say, I feel like I'm the one that's cursed. My life's cursed right now. Well, there's one or two reasons. Is God's either allowing you to learn to wait and he's allowing you to learn warfare. If there's nothing that you, in your life that you're doing wrong, you know, I, I typically have a process I go through. If something's, you know, things just seem like they're not happening, 
whatever the case might be. And this goes on and it keeps going a long time. The first thing I do is I say, okay, am I, am I in some sin here that it's like this that I'm not aware of? I mean, you know, it can't be something real big or I think I'd catch that. But maybe my attitude's wrong. Maybe my heart, maybe, I, and I'll go through this whole process of searching my heart to find out, Lord, am I doing something? If I determine there's something there, then I repent. If I can't find anything other than knowing I'm a sinner, that never goes away, but not any things that are glaring at me, Mark, you're involved, you're doing this, whatever. Then I say, all right, Lord, there's nothing I know of. I don't know why the delay is, so I'm just going to trust you and keep waiting on you. And then I wait on God until God brings to pass what it is he wants to do in my life. The same thing is true for all of us. If there's something going on where you feel like, where is God? Why am I not hearing the Lord? Why, is, why have I been waiting so long for whatever the thing might be that you're waiting on God? Ask yourself, is there something in your life that's hindering God's spirit? Check that first. And if you determine, no, there's, there's nothing. Really, there's nothing hindering God's spirit. I'm not, I can't, you know, you, I mean, if you're in sin, you're going to know it. If there's not, then say, all right, Lord, then I'm going to wait on you and trust in you. But don't sit around for, you know, eight years, 18 years, you know, whatever, waiting while you're suffering in the consequences of not walking with God to finally cry out to God. You know, I, I, I hear stories again as a pastor about people that walk away from God for years and years and years and their life gets wiped out. And then they come back in the church and they're just beaten up so bad. And you know, you don't tell them at that time, you know, that's not the time you want to say, told you so, or, um, you know, that's what you get. You know, that's not love. No, that's a time you just say, you know what, welcome back. Welcome back. Let me pray for you. How can we help you? Let's get you back on your feet. And you love them and minister to them. But you, in your back of your mind, you're thinking, why did it take so long? Why did you have to lose your family? Why did you have to end up in jail? Why did, why did all these things have to happen and get so bad before you'd finally cry out to God again? We can learn those lessons. You know, I'm not going to let my life get to that point. If you're going down that road and already you know you're grieving God's spirit, you know you're going a direction you shouldn't go, don't let it drag on. I, I challenge you tonight, get it right with God. Get it right. Say, God, this is it. I'm turning back. I'm going to turn back to you. We're going to make this thing right. I'm tired of living out there, whatever. And, and again, your flesh is going to fight you on that because your flesh is going to say, yeah, but this is kind of fun right now. Well, you know what? It'll kill you. It'll destroy you. Lord, forgive me. I want to get back with you, and I want to walk with you, and I want to see the blessing, your blessing flow through my life again. And so um, if that's where you are, I encourage you. Take care of it tonight. Deal with it. And maybe, you know, maybe there's somebody that, again, you're right at the front end of that, and God brought this message tonight, so you would say, you know what? I hear you, Lord. I'm going to, I'm going to respond to it. And so respond. Heed the lead of the Lord, and, uh, and God will be faithful. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you again for how you just show us over and over that if we'll just cry out, you always hear us. Lord, you are always there. You're always listening. But you, you, you're not one that just turns your ear away. Now, if, if we continue to grieve you, Lord, and we don't repent, then you'll let us just go on in that. But if we truly cry out from our heart, God, you are a God that forgives and restores. And so, Lord, I just pray um, that if there's any tonight, whether it's in this room or some other means, somebody you know, listening by the internet or watching uh, through the streaming or listening by radio at, a, at whatever the case might be and they realize you know what this is this message this was for me you've just heard pastor mark teaching from the book of judges here on come to the table one of the most remarkable stories from judges is the story of gideon with just 300 men Gideon and the Israelites defeated an army of 135,000 Midianites. But it wasn't because Gideon was a military genius or because the Israelites had some new advanced weapon. It's because Gideon trusted and obeyed God. God fought for the Israelites and completely defeated the Midianites. To God, it doesn't matter if you have 10 men or 1,000 men on your side. And it doesn't matter who or how many are against you. If God is for you, then no one can stand against you. Don't trust in your own power and wisdom. Trust in God because the battle belongs to the Lord. If today's message had an impact on you, would you let us know by using our questions or comments link found on our website, thewaymedia.net? This is a good way for us to gauge how we can better serve you, our listeners. While you're there, stay a while. Familiarize yourself with our ministry and what we're about. Come to the Table is a ministry out of Calvary, Knoxville. If you find yourself traveling through, staying in, or residing in Knoxville, Tennessee, we hope you'll come check us out at Calvary, Knoxville. Consider that an invitation from us to you. We'd love to have you. Service times can be found at thewaymedia.net. 
Just scroll down and find the link to Calvary Knoxville. Well, that's all the time we have for you today, but we want to say thank you for listening. Pastor Mark has more in Judges, so join us again on the next edition of Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.